first step um, is the Strawn Donnelly uh, uh, lecture on conservation and restoration. And we have uh, uh, two um, uh, presentations before that. One is a biography of, uh, of Strawn, which will be delivered by his wife, uh, Vivian, who sits on our board. And then, and then from there, we'll go to the introduction of the, of the speaker and the talk itself. Thank you. Um, hi, I am Vivian Donnelly, and this is not really a biography of my late husband, Strawn. It is a, I guess you might say, a sort of a remembrance. I grew up in Hutchinson, Kansas, just about an hour away from here. Um, I met Strawn Donnelly when I was a student at Valparaiso University in Indiana, and he was a teacher there um, trying to get to 26 and avoid the draft. So he was teaching. <laughs> in still somewhat frowned upon but classic fashion, we got married after my senior year as a student and teacher and embarked on a life together. His PhD studies in philosophy took us to New York City. And lo, these many 40 odd years later, there I remained. Five daughters, 10 grandchildren, very good friends, a couple of whom are here now, close extended family, three, a sister and two sisters-in-law here, um, satisfying work and deep interests. It adds up to a pretty fulfilling life. And my life as it is now is a legacy of Strawn's and mine intertwined. Strawn was a man of passions, not an ivory tower thinker, um, our loud and sprawling, sprawling household wouldn't really allow for that. But he regarded careful thinking as his life's work. He wrote and taught and published. He stood on the sidelines at soccer games. He presided over family dinner conversations. He listened to music. He went fishing. He read. His interest in humans and nature and environmental ethics brought him into contact with Wes Jackson, I think in the early 90s. Um, but when they met, their bond was rot. Fast friends from the get-go, they loved to talk, to theorize, to egg each other on. They got each other, and Strawn got what Wes was attempting to do here at the Land Institute. While maintaining his own richly contoured work and personal life, Strawn supported Wes in all of the ways he was capable of doing. I'm not sure what he would think about the Strawn Donnelly Memorial Lecture. In general, he wasn't a big believer in things being named after him or indeed um, naming opportunities per se. But as his <coughs> wife, I'm kind of proud. <laughs> I'm proud of the caliber of speakers who have come here under this aegis certainly including today's speaker, Peter Kenmore. Strawn himself spoke here at the Prairie Festival a number of times. But back then, I was usually at home wrestling kids going back to school and couldn't be here. Yet it isn't really a stretch for me to see him standing here at this podium, jingling the change in his pockets, a nervous tick, and he always did it, but his face would be intent and animated. He would be so eager to embark on yet another deeply thoughtful, grounded, philosophic riff. For him, this was high level fun. Thank you very much. I'm the sister of Strawn Donnelly and Laura Donnelly. Um, I think the first year that the lecture series was instituted, I was prevailed upon to do a big long talk about my family and why we got the way we got. Basically, we grew up on a farm. 
and it really informed pretty much everything we've done since. So I'm here actually to introduce Peter Kenmore. And I did not know him personally until last night. We've had a couple of really nice talks. And this morning he passes me a cheat sheet that is much more informative than what the internet says about you. So I'm going to start out a little bit with <laughs> what it says, because I think it's great. Peter Kenmore comes from a family of people who've worked in teaching, public service, medicine, research, civil rights movement, as well as overseas missionary. He grew up in and around Washington, D.C. He's an evolutionary biologist with a biology degree from Harvard and a Ph.D. in entomology from the University of California, Berkeley. So Peter began, I think, almost 40 years ago working with the International Rice Research Foundation or Institute on rice systems ecology and then with the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, which um, has been working in integrated pest management programming involving policy advice to 13 countries, practical field education. He instituted, I believe, the farmers field schools through government extension and NGOs to over 2 million farmers all over the world in 100,000 communities. I think that's pretty impressive to come before this, but I think at this point, Peter is in no way about to give it up. Right now, however, he is the proud grandparent of a one and a half year old child, granddaughter who he and his wife are parenting wonderfully while their kids go to work every day. And I want to say that I think how important that is, being a grandparent, that he is placing his, whatever, the foundations for the future. And I think that's what it's really most, that's what's most important. Um, there's more, there's quite a bit more, but honestly, I think he, you want to hear from him. So. Without further ado, thank you, Peter, for coming. Please, come on up. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I must confess that since Wes asked me here, I have since then, become edified by Strom Donnelly's good and practical work at the Hastings Institute, his article in Wes and Bill's book, Ignorance Book, I call it, uh, which is actually about one of my teachers, Ernst Meyer. Um, but I hadn't thought, I hadn't thought that I actually owned any of Strom's work. Then I came across a title, the book came out 15 years ago called Wolves and Human Communities. Biology, politics, and ethics, which sounds, from everything I've heard about Strawn, to be a very quintessential kind of Strawn topic. And I realized I did have a copy. And it made me smile. The book was put out with the American Museum of Natural History, and it centers on a case study of reestablishing wolves, reestablishing wolves in the Adirondack Mountains back east with characteristic care and in the well-founded spirit of Aldo Leopold, who taught the urgency of thinking like a mountain while looking into the eyes of a wolf. Strawn and his co-editors made <coughs> sure, firstly, that all key perspectives were represented, including those of the Iroquois nation. And secondly, that what you're going to hear me talking about that the co-production or co-creation of understanding among the people holding these different points of view was achieved. It was, wolves now for a second, wolves are and remain, were then and remain a very hot issue. I smiled and I still smile because Five weeks ago, on August the 20th, 2015, 
The California Wildlife Agency announced to considerable local interest and concern that a wolf pack, dubbed the Shasta wolf pack after the volcanic cone of Mount Shasta, had established itself in California the first time in 91 years. The result, of course, was pandemonium. <laughs> Which Strawn understood. And I hope that Strawn's wise words will be brought to the attention of the now dry state of California in time to bend the arc of history a little more towards Aldo Leopold. So I was happy to be able to refresh myself, but to also to understand what Strawn's part in, in thinking about that was. Um, you've heard from Laura, I spent most, almost the last 40 years, 39 almost now, uh, working outside the US, um, most of it in Asia, um, tropical Asia, again, Southeast Asia, and then increasingly more in South Asia, like in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, <coughs> And um, I try to apply ecology and especially evolutionary ecology to issues of rice production. I think rice is uh, important. I think it's reasonably safe to agree with, I think it was Hugh Thomas, the historian, who said that at least for the last 10,000 years, more human beings have been rice farmers than any other occupation. So in that sense, the last 10,000 years are in some ways, the idea of a coevolution of two species, the rise of sativa and homo sapiens. And uh, when I started doing some of that work or deciding to do it um, back in 1973, um, I hadn't realized it at the time, but 30 years later, I looked at the statistics and found out that the consumer price index adjusted price of rice, price of food grains that poor people around the world have to, to pay, 1973 was the highest ever recorded. It's been recorded since 1950. So CPI adjusted, right? We're not talking about the, ap the, the relative. We're just talking about the actual, the real price in terms that people care about. Uh, that was when food was most expensive and people were hungry. And there were... Um, Different things set off in 1973. It was sort of in the, in the, in the uh, sequelae of Earth Day and such. And it was the time that I decided to um, uh, go into agriculture. Um, now, I got to say that um, <clears throat> my being tremendously honored uh, by the invitation from West to come uh, and discovering more and more that this particular lecture has such tradition, um, I have to say that my being here seems to have two, represent two breaks with that tradition. And maybe breaking with tradition is a good thing in the life of any institution that will be sustained. And you have to be able to, to know not whether to break or not, sometimes it's forced upon you, but to embrace that and engage with the breaks in tradition. Anyway, the two tiny minor parts of that tradition I represent is, as to, to quote what used to be the loyalty oath formulation, I am not now, <laughs> nor have I ever been a university professor. <laughs> Secondly, this is my first visit to the Land Institute. Oh, not your last. Thank you. I promise it will not be my last. Um, and so in that sense, um, I might do this a little bit differently. And my ways of doing things are, are you know, sort of in, in, because I worked for so long outside of one culture and outside of this culture that's sitting here today. And so sometimes I may do things that, what did Abraham Herschel say? Prophets speak in an octave too loud. They sing an octave too high, that's it. 
an octave too. So sometimes I may say things or do things and I beg your indulgence. I apologize in advance if I say things that either aren't easy to understand or, or um, uh, make a problem. Uh, part, part of this, but we, we don't get to it for a little bit, but part of this, do people have their little bags? Yeah, that's my present to you all. There's a bunch of here. Did you get them on this side? Now you do. Pass them. Thanks. Um, uh, in fact, this is half of, the, half of it. The other half is a little more complicated, and you should probably do it afterwards. But thanks to tremendous cooperation with a very difficult last-minute request, the staff here at the Land Institute got some dry soil. <laughs> and, and they protected, I mean, this is a lecture about conservation, right? They protected that soil all through the deluge. <laughs> and there's a bunch of soil in a wheelbarrow here. Scott has been managing this entire process, and I'm very grateful to, to him. And uh, there's a wheelbarrow here with soil. And, if you want to come do it during my talk, that's also okay, or after the talk. The idea is to have, as in this one, have kind of a bag full of soil. Have a bag full of soil. And I'll get to why the, the bag is like this and what, what the importance is. And I'll ask you a couple more, well, once, maybe twice more in the talk to lift up your bags at a certain point. Um, okay, now... Because of my being new here and fresh, um, I, yeah, I thought I would begin with a, just, a, a, just a couple of sentences. I, I took my bucket to the very deep well of spirit, words, and thinking of Frederick Douglass. In the beginning of a talk he gave in July 1852 in Rochester, any person who could address this audience with a, without a quailing sensation, has stronger nerves than I have. <laughs> I don't remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with a greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. and. Um, should I seem at ease, my appearance would much misrepresent me. The fact is, friends, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform, this platform, and the world of Asian smallholder family farmers from which I just officially retired after 38 years is considerable. And the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter here to the former are by no means slight. That I'm here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. And I thank Wes for that. But I must beg your kind indulgence and, and ask you please to work together with me as we co-create and co-construct both this, this break with tradition and explore a new operating space together, a space of greater scope where the Land Institute can realize what I think is a genuine and a magnificent potential to assist and to co-create with millions of people, millions of farmers around the world beyond the Flint Hills and beyond the, the different stages of the prairie that I reacquainted myself with driving from Kansas City yesterday, um, way beyond. And there's a lot of partners out there. And I think that there's very exciting future in working with those partners. And I'm going to eventually make three points which I believe to be relevant to that. But to begin with, and to connect, again, with a bit of, of uh, 
perhaps tradition in this country, I invite you to go with me for about two, three minutes to another Prairie Fest. That Prairie Fest was held this same week, the last week of September in 1859. And it was held in Madison, Wisconsin. So sort of the northeast end of the prairie. The speaker, as I'm today, but in no other way comparable, the speaker was Abraham Lincoln. This is the only recorded instance of a speech by or speech or a talk or a lecture by Lincoln to farmers for farmers. It's the only one there is. I'm going to read you just a, a, a few paragraphs. Agricultural fairs are becoming an institution of the country. They are useful in more ways than one. They bring us together and thereby make us better acquainted and better friends than we otherwise would be. The chief use of agricultural fairs is to aid in improving the great calling of agriculture in all its departments and minute divisions, to make mutual exchange, to make mutual exchange of agricultural discovery, co-creation, sorry, editorial comment, information and knowledge so that at the end all may know everything which may have been known to but one or but a few at the beginning. To bring together especially all which is supposed to not generally be known because of recent discovery or invention. And to correct the evils great and small which spring from want of sympathy and from positive enmity among strangers as nations or in, as individuals is one of the highest functions of civilization. To this end our agricultural fairs contribute in no small degree. They make more pleasant and more strong and more durable the bond of social and political union among us. Lincoln then goes sort of on a riff, as Vivian said this morning. He goes on a riff about steam-powered plows, but I will spare you that part of it. <laughs> I mean, it was, a, it was astounding, and it's fun to read, but no. Okay, later, getting into one of his kind of themes, he says, the world is agreed that labor is the source from which human wants are mainly supplied, but they further assume that whoever is once a hired laborer is fatally fixed in that condition for life, and thence again that his condition is as bad as or worse than that of a slave. This is the mud sill theory. Mud sill. Okay? When you step over the threshold, it's where you wipe your feet. It's below everything else in the house. And that was the image that Lincoln used to talk about people at the bottom. By the mud still theory, it is assumed that labor and education, that labor and education are incompatible, and any practical combination of them impossible. According to that theory, a blind horse upon a treadmill is a perfect illustration of what a laborer should be, all the better for being blind, that he could not tread out of place or kick understandingly. According to that theory, the education of laborers is not only useless, but pernicious and dangerous. In fact, it is in some sort deemed a misfortune that laborers should have heads at all. The same heads are regarded as explosive materials only to be safely kept in damp places as far as possible from the peculiar sort of fire which ignites them. But free labor says... No. Every head should be cultivated and improved by whatever will add to its capacity for performing its charge. In one word, free labor insists on universal education. This leads to the further reflection that no other human occupation opens so wide a field for the profitable and agreeable combination of labor with cultivated thought as agriculture. I know of nothing so pleasant to the mind as the discovery, the discovery 
of anything which is at once new and valuable, nothing which so lightens and sweetens toil as the hopeful pursuit of such discovery. He's talking about everybody doing it. Co-creation, not just scientists, everybody. And how vast and how varied a field is agriculture for such discovery. The mind already trained to thought in the country school or higher school cannot fail to find there an exhaustless source of profitable enjoyment. Every blade of grass is a study, and to produce two where there was but one is both a profit and a pleasure. And not grass alone, but he starts with grass. But soils, wheelbarrow please, <laughs> soils, seeds and seasons, hedges, ditches and fences, draining droughts and irrigation, yeah, this morning, yeah. plowing, hoeing and harrowing, reaping, mowing, threshing, saving crops, pests of crops, diseases of crops and what will prevent or cure them, implements, utensils and machines, their relative merits and how to improve them, hogs, horses, and cattle, sheep, goats, and poultry, trees, shrubs, fruits, plants, and flowers. The thousand things of which use are specimens, each a world of study within itself. In all this, book learning is available. A capacity and taste for reading gives access to whatever has already been discovered by others. It's a key or maybe one of the keys to the already solved problems. And not only so, it gives a relish and facility for successfully pursuing the yet unsolved ones. The rudiments of science are available and highly valuable. Knowledge of botany and chemistry, selection manures and numerous other ways. The thought recurs that education, cultivated thought, can best be combined with agricultural labor or any labor on the principle of thorough work. Careless, half-performed, slovenly work makes no place for such combination. And thorough work, again, renders sufficient the smallest quantity of ground to each man. And this, again, conforms to what must occur in a world less inclined to wars and more devoted to the arts of peace than heterophore. Population must increase rapidly, more rapidly than in former times, and ere long, the most valuable of all arts will be the art of deriving a comfortable subsistence from the smallest area of soil. No community whose every member possesses this art can ever be the victim of oppression of any, in any of its forms. Such community will be alike independent of crowned kings, money kings, and land kings. But if, um, I mean, this is already sitting in the text, but when two days ago, yeah, the Pope talks to our esteemed <laughs> legislature, talks about four Americans, and who does he start with? Hey, Blinken, because he's talking about the world and people in it. A couple of points of context, when he gave that speech, Lincoln, was an out-of-office politician with a self-styled taste but no more than embryonic prospects for national position. He had, the year before, been defeated for the U.S. Senate by Stephen Douglas of Kansas-Nebraska Act notoriety. But after a time of recovery and reflection, he began to give speeches outside his native state of Illinois. Wisconsin, this speech, <clears throat> was the second or third such foray, and two months later, during your territorial elections, Kansas was the next. Two months later, first week of December, the only time Lincoln ever came to Kansas, three days. I actually went up and I drove up to Donovan in the, in the, up in the northeast corner of the state. Donovan is a town of population, current populations I found from a couple hours talking with folks of 32 people. <laughs> but Lincoln gave a speech there. Between the two speeches, Wisconsin and Kansas, incidentally, The Origin of Species was published. And it flew off the shelves of booksellers. The first, pub, the first printing sold out in a week. 
and it kept going. So just to give you a sense of what was happening in that time. Okay, as I said, I'm gonna try to make three points in the next 20 to 24 minutes. Again, from my experience working mostly in Asia. First, a technical point, which is at the foundation of Lincoln's surprisingly detailed list of technical subjects. I mean, Lincoln's list of subjects is what deans in every land-grant ag school say about 10 times a year. I mean, that's, that's what people say. At the foundation, however, and what we now think about is an ecological concept, what we call food webs. That's who eats whom. Herbivores, whether they're cows or mites, eat plants. Predators eat herbivores. Predators and parasitoids eat other predators. And they fit together. Everything is recycled through decomposers. It's not the best. It's a pretty clumsy um, taxonomy, but it's worked, and it keeps working. Food, applying the ecological concept of food webs is a necessary and useful part of any practical program to make agriculture fit better in the environment. This holds for rice agroecosystems that feed more people than any other crop, but it also holds for the perennial cereal systems that are at the heart of the Land Institute's work. Thinking, <clears throat> as we'll see, about rice in India Applying this concept contributed to insecticide use dropping by over 25%, which means accumulatively more than 1 million tons of pesticide not used, while food grain production increased 42%. Insecticide use down 25, actually it started, it dropped even lower, but then stabilized a little bit higher. But it's still more than 25% below what it was in 20 two years ago, food production up by 42%, uh, food grains, cereals and pulses, land institute kind of crops. Second, a practical point. As Lincoln insisted, education, in particular self-education, he talked about discovery by everybody. He wasn't talking about a one-way flow of discovery by people locked in a university or a field station or something like that and then giving out the little nuggets of peer-reviewed wisdom. He was talking about everybody participating. And, of course, you wanted to know what was in what we would call the literature to see what other people thought on problems, as, as Lincoln says, were already solved. But to the new problems, everybody's part of it. So education is a necessary and useful foundation for agriculture and for farm life. No technical input whether seed, machine, manure, or other, can contribute to its potential unless farmers are educated. Why? So they can critique what the researchers say. So they can co-create knowledge and they can co-create new practice in their fields. And that's, friends, that works in every continent. A team I convened and guided in FAO for over a decade with farmers co-created what we call farmer field schools, which are groups of 25 farmers get together in the field once a week or once every two weeks, that now work in over 60 countries and in total now have graduated over 12 million smallholder family farmers. 12 million. And in the United States of America, according to the USDA, which we don't always believe the numbers anyway, there's not quite two million farms in the entire United States. So we actually need to have 120 million farmers out of farmer field schools, but we're gonna work on it. Same kind of scale as perennial, you know, domesticating perennials. It'll take time. But so far we've got 12 million since, uh, yeah, around about 20 to 25 years. Third, if you will, an emancipatory point. And here I'm just gonna mention and I may not have time at the end to go through all the details, but I'm going to refer you to an expert in Minneapolis, Kansas, 35 minutes from where we are now. There's a museum there. I'm talking 
It's a place where it's one of the best exhibits in the world about an exemplary young exoduster who was born traumatically, traumatically in slavery, educated himself as he came to maturity in Kansas, largely in Minneapolis, Kansas, just up the road from here. And I'm talking, of course, about Professor George W. Carver. I, my point is that he is a vastly underappreciated pioneer, both in applying ecology to agriculture and in co-creating knowledge and science with impoverished smallholder family farmers, mostly near Tuskegee, Alabama and in Macon County. As the Land Institute considers a future where its contributions to the world of smallholder family farmers and pastoralists applying ecological lessons from the prairie around us, <clears throat> it should study and take very seriously lessons offered by Professor Carver. As much of the current respect for Professor Carver's work has been prompted by one of Professor Don Worcester's students, Mark Hersey, it should be possible for the Land Institute to get access to that information. Okay. You've heard the important points. I'm now sort of, oh, okay, yeah, we'll get to this one. So when I first came to the Rice Institute in 1977, this is now back on the technical point. I'll go through quickly through the three points in a one cut deeper. Then is now, plant breeders ruled the roost. Technology went into the seeds of the Green Revolution. If it didn't fit into the seed or meet the strict monocultural requirements of the seeds, then it would likely would be studied and shelved. This was a comfortable way to support the true believer devotion of senior plant breeding scientists to their named and released varieties. Entomology, in fact, was led by a series of graduates of Kansas State University in Manhattan because Professor Reginald Painter basically created the art and craft and eventually science of breeding resistance to insects into crops. <clears throat> and he worked on all sorts of things, uh, hessian flies on wheat, uh, corn rootworms, chinch bug on sorghums, green bugs and ligus on alfalfa. We were, Tim talked to me about ligus yesterday. But there was a problem with sort of a mono uh, concentration on plant breeding. An insect called the rice brown plant hopper kept exploding, both in the well insecticide sprayed test plots and in farmers fields across Asia. And they invented new varieties to be resistant. And because Mr. Darwin, who published his work during the, the time of the first prairie fest, Mr. Darwin is still correct. The bugs learned how to eat every variety that was thrown at it. There were three different rounds of biotype selection. Um, so a small team came at the problem differently, and this was the team that I was part of, and looked at the food webs of rice. Turned out that in fields not sprayed with insecticides, not only did brown plant hopper not explode, but there were more species of animal feeding, predaceous insects and spiders than there were more species of predators than there were of rice feeding herbivores. Um, let's see. They punt in different ways. Some, the biggest ones, skirt around both the water and up the plants and down. These are the wolf spiders. An adult pregnant female wolf spider can eat 25 to 30 bad guy bugs in one day. Why? How? Because she's maturing her own eggs and she has a high demand for protein. And so it's natural for her to do that. And that's tremendous. You kill them, and the bugs, the bad bugs, multiply. The other kind is of water striders, including teeny tiny water striders that incidentally also eat mosquito larvae. Teeny tiny water striders that are dancing on the surface of the water. You've seen these things, right? Every, every freshwater pond, every, every slow moving creek, anybody who's a, a fishes, a fly fish or something, they're around. But the point is, they, um, oh, here, yes. In honor of Strawn, I use coins instead of keys. But, so, but if there's a disturbance in the force, if there's a disturbance, 
that hits the, the rice paddy water. Did everybody here hear that? That was sound waves coming to you. These bugs deal with water waves. They have their legs are like amplifiers, like the old, some of the old sound reproduction equipment. And so if something falls off the plant, including teeny tiny bad guy bugs, they'll concentrate, they'll aggregate around it. <laughs> and I mean, you know, you get six or seven of these on one, they may only be a quarter of the size, but six or seven will do it up fine. <laughs> they also conduct their elegant love life, their elegant courtships and whatever other metaphors we use for copulation with tapping. So it's not just hunting, it's also sex. <laughs> and they do a good job of it. And so reproduction. So I said, um, in a non-sprayed rice field, there's a food web with over 500 species in total in a hectare if you don't spray it. 500 species in a hectare is amazing. That's on 10 tons of standing plant biomass. It's the same ratio, more or less, of arthropod diversity to plant biomass as a tropical rainforest. The numbers there are 20,000 species for 400 tons. It's about the same ratio as long as you don't treat it with insecticides. So by carrying this paradigm which worked in other crops, now here's the punchline for Wes. The other crops where my work and the work of my team imitated was almost all done in perennials. Tree crops, okay, get real. I mean, we're talking about citrus, coconuts, oil palm, um, apricots, walnuts, any of those things kept a food web going year round. And that's where we learned and what we were trying to do is recreate in the annual rice paddy, which you can do if you can plant and harvest every day. I mean, you can play around with rice easier in the, in the humid tropics. We were trying to recreate the kind of, of um, foundation stone that they had in perennial tree crops. And uh, you know, it shouldn't surprise anybody at the Land Institute, it worked. And um, we took that into farmers' communities and at the same time into policymakers' conference rooms. And um, I've given you the numbers before that you had tremendous reductions in insecticide use involving lots of people. I mean, India was the biggest number of people, but Indonesia had a bigger reduction. It was instead of 25%, it was 60% reduction. Okay, and that's a, that's a, a country of 220 million people. Okay, two-thirds the size of the U.S. Okay, now let's talk just quickly about perennials, uh, cereals and the prairie. Now, please hold up your bag. Fantastic. Microaggregates are the smallest chunk of food web in the soil. They are about 200 microns across, which means 20% of a millimeter. You can't really see it, but it's just at the edge. They contain bacteria, fungi, and nematodes, microaggregates. All they need is a bit of root or decayed leaf to munch on as an energy source or some sugary ooze from the nearby roots. If two of these micro chunks share a rootlet, that would constitute a micro-ecosystem. So about 400 microns across. Your bags, and you can fill them up afterwards. Um, it works sort of with fingers. Yeah, but hold it over the soil so that you don't drop it. So you can sort of fill the thing up. If you, if you fill it up, it's pretty stuffed. I won't tell you that there are a million ecosystems in this, but I will tell you there's 700,000. <laughs> 400 microns cubed times, with these bags, I had, a, I had smaller ones and the numbers didn't work, so I had to get a little more expensive ones. <laughs> but, 
These bags, which will hold 14, 15 cubic centimeters, that represents, ah, remember what the caveat was in rice, as long as it wasn't sprayed with insecticide. If you have a healthy soil, this much soil, and I would really encourage everybody to grab a little bit on your way out. That's, that's land institute soil. That is better than what you're going to get in the soybean, the transgenic soybean that you got outside. Um, 700,000 ecosystems in that bag. Take it home. Think about it. Two bags makes more than a million. Ecosystems in your hand. That's the real sustainable function, the sustainable product of the perennial work here, is ecosystems that deliver, ecosystems that create channels and hold water, ecosystems that transform uh, dead stuff, <coughs> dead, dead formerly living stuff so that you get nitrogen. Ecosystems that through mycorrhizal associates, which almost every plant has, will go out into the soil and grab phosphorus. Tim did some very nice work in Rothamsted about that stuff. But I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that goes on in those soil ecosystems. And that is why those roots over there on that side of the barn are so important. Yeah, they look great. You know, wow. Two meters of roots, great. Why? Because of the ecosystems. Because those little tiny ecosystems will work. And the more they work, the more this perennial system will withstand. OK, yeah, no, and they do better in the, in the perennials. The lesson is that as with rice food webs, is that they need to be understood and cared for consciously, like Chinese farmers in Hunan province who protect spiders during the winter. They make little houses for them with straw. The tools for understanding those micro-ecosystems are improving. By the time in one and a half to two decades when we get, um, when the Land Institute has co-domesticated with farmers and national researchers perennial cereals for West Africa, East Africa, and South Asia, the tools for monitoring and managing soil food webs will be available for farmers' use. But researchers can use them right now. And the Land Institute should build on the work, its teams, and the, one of the guys that led part of that was Steve Coleman, who's now at Ohio State, but he was here and still collaborating. But with him and other collaborators like Louise Jackson and Howard Ferris at UC Davis, what's important, okay, and now here's the... Here's the sting in the tail, right? Here's the last little bit. What's important is to ensure that in the Land Institute that the disconnect I found at the International Rice Research Institute 38 years ago, the disconnect between the ecosystem work and the plant breeding work, that that doesn't come to haunt your perennial cereals. Okay? Thank you. These are soils that I collected, two from towns where Lincoln visited, Atchison and Donovan, two for places where George Washington Carver lived, Kansas City and Minneapolis. Okay. One question, how many ecosystems are in the soil that you use? Well, the, the, the soil insecticide use isn't as bad as it is in the top part of, of the rice. But what, I, what we were talking about is the kind of annual crop flood it with, with um, uh, inorganic or uh, highly synthetic fertilizers. Those are the kinds of things that will mess up the soil ecosystems. Um, and the answer is one whole hell of a lot less. I don't, I, don't have an, I don't have a number quick at hand. I will, however, tell you. It's a funny number, but it was so funny that I remember it, okay? Um, desert oasis. 
If you look in a soil under the oasis in a desert where you have a dozen little palm trees and a little bit of water and stuff like that, per cubic centimeter, you know, they got like 9 billion organisms, right? You go one meter out of the oasis, right? And you reduce that by like a million times. Now that's a natural ecotone. That's a natural edge of an ecosystem. But uh, based on what we did with insecticides and rice, the answer is it's devastating. And quite honestly, recovery of those ecosystems in the soil is not automatic. That's why we need to use the tools that people can use to measure how those ecosystems are doing. Because, as I said, we've got networks of farmers. By 10, 20 years from now, we're going to have, I hope, 100 million farmers out in Africa, East and West, Asia, Near East, poorer parts of Latin America. Those farmers will be ready to use tools to be able to take the temperature of their soil and preserve healthy ecosystems because they're already conserving healthy ecosystems in the crops on top. If they aren't involved, and this is again a lesson <laughs> that should be learned here, as you move into the work in other parts of the world especially, you have to involve farmers early in, the, in everything that you can afford, that everything you physically can get together with farmers is always useful. Why? See a Blinken, <laughs> okay? Because that discovery process, that co-creation of knowledge is the most effective, the most enduring, and the most efficient way to get knowledge across. And it's important. And that's why George Washington Carver is an example. Because he did it. He made a principled choice to work with poor African-American farmers. He went to Iowa State. He was the first African-American graduate of Iowa State. <laughs> and they offered him a position. And he respectfully declined and went to Tuskegee. That's what you, that's what it means. Peter Kenmore, thank you. The, uh, a reminder that we'll have uh, CDs available of all the talks today and tomorrow, uh, available at the bookstore. They usually uh, are there uh, just minutes after, after each speech, so, so you, can, you can partake of that. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we, uh, we understand that some people outside the barn are having difficulty hearing. And we, the sound speakers are not working, but we're hoping to get them going as soon as possible. Uh, so thank you for your patience for that. Also, there's a water station uh, is under the tent on the hill directly behind us. So if you need to fill your water bottle and so forth, uh, th that's the place to go. And thirdly, uh, personal campfires are not allowed on the grounds anywhere. So if you've, uh, if you've had a personal fire, please make sure it's extinguished and, and not fired up again. Um, I remind you that uh, Prairie Land has a concession stand. They're selling lunches. We've got lunches av available. Uh, you, can buy, uh, you can buy a ticket in advance if you wish. Prairie Land is a local food co-op. They're uh, a great supporter of the, of the Land Institute. Um, we don't have, uh, you know, all the fast food chains out here in this uh, neck of the woods, so we, we rely on them to, <laughs> to give us sustenance. So thank you for that, and, and, and thank you, Prairie Land. Um, one of the things the comment sheets told us is that uh, we need to remember our breaks. So let's take one now, and we'll, we'll return at 20 after 10 and, uh, and get uh, hear from the scientists. <laughs> 